Well, we're glad you're here this morning, and, and like Pastor Trent said, so excited for the 75th celebration. Hope you can make it. Hope your friends and family can make it. Now, I know some of you are reaching for your phones to check the Viking schedule. Don't worry, they're playing tomorrow. So don't worry about it. Vikings are playing at uh, Monday night with, with my Buffalo Bills headlining the Monday night affairs. And so, and so don't worry, you, you can come, and your neighbors can come, and their neighbors can come today because there's no really other meaningful football to play today. So uh, if you have your Bibles, uh, please open them to the book of Daniel. We are continuing in our series called Run to the Roar, and, and, and last week we looked at the opening of Daniel chapter 1, and this morning we're going to still be in that section, and, and we're going to go a little further through the end of chapter 1. And so we're going to read verses uh, 1, 1 through 7 of Daniel 1. This is what it says. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace, and to teach them the literature and the language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar, Hananiah he called Shadrach, Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. Now last week, we looked at the history of the superpowers surrounding the people of Judah, and how they came to the point of the people of Judah being taken into exile to the land of Babylon under the new king, King Nebuchadnezzar. And we talked a little bit about this last week, but it's worth spending more time on today. Because Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians, they had a way to conquer nations. Sure, they would take and conquer the actual city, the brick and mortar, and they would cripple their economy, but their conquering strategy was much more subtle than any of these means. The Babylonian infiltration would take place through the heart and through the mind. And as we read last week in Daniel 1, 1 through 7, the best and the brightest youths, including Daniel and his three friends, were taken to Babylon and were put through a three-year educational program to make them fit for being a part of the king's palace. They would eat the king's food, drink the king's wine, and they would learn all the ways of the Babylonians and would then be put in front of the king for examination. In this form of conquering, was a sinister syllabus from the Babylonians that targeted the human heart. And the syllabus of cultural reprogramming includes these four elements. It includes isolation, indoctrination, compromise, and confusion. And the first part of this reprogramming is isolation. Now notice in Daniel 1 that Nebuchadnezzar didn't set up a Babylon University satellite campus in Judah. There wasn't a satellite where, where, where people in Judah could go study the Babylonian culture from the comfort of their own home. They were taken from their land, taken from Judah and brought to exile. They were taken from the place where they learned about God, about the God of Israel, the one true God, Yahweh, and were isolated from their faith communities. Even above the physical isolation from, from, from the people and the places they were separated from, the exiles had their faith and their values isolated from the Babylonian cultural reprogramming syllabus. In Nebuchadnezzar's mind, if he could get these exiles to a place where nobody else believed what they believed, that their isolated faith would eventually shrivel out due to lack of like-minded soil surrounding it. 
And this isolation leads into the second part of this cultural reprogramming syllabus, which is indoctrination. We read in verse 4 that these exiles were to be taught the language and the literature of the Chaldeans. They were to be surrounded by all things Babylon, from the literature to the culture and to the language. And in this, it was apparently okay for Daniel and his friends to learn these things because we don't read about any resistance from them. And the reason why they were okay with learning these things is that they were learning for understanding, but not for belief. They were learning for understanding, but not for belief. Because the goal of the Babylonians was to indoctrinate the exiles with so much with their culture and their literature and their media of that day to the point where the exiles would eventually think like a Babylonian instead of an Israelite. Do you see the subtlety of that? They didn't tell them when they arrived in Babylon, you are Babylonians now. But it was subtle. They would give them the language in front of them. And then they put some literature in front of them. Then some forms of entertainment. Then some religious practices until the person had all but forgotten the things of God, the God of Israel. And their thought process was formed into the Babylonian mold. Now, if this subtle approach didn't fully work on everybody who was in exile, this next item on the agenda would probably do the trick, and that was compromise. In addition to these exiles being indoctrinated with all things Babylon, they were also fed the king's food, as we read in verse 5. Now, scholars differ on, on the various reasons why Daniel and his friends took issue with this piece of the Babylonian agenda, but two things seem clear. The first thing is that the compromise happens based on where the food comes from. In the Babylonian culture, in that religious system, what they would do is they would offer that food as a religious sacrifice to their idols, to their gods and their goddesses. So for Daniel and his friends to eat that food would be engaging in an act of worship of these idols. Now, I want you to think for a moment with me. Because remember, Daniel and his friends are just teenagers at this point. Think of how easy of a jump it would be for Daniel to compromise. He's away from home. He's away from his parents. He's in a new land. A lot of gold, a lot of silver, a lot of shiny new things. And the king's food is put in front of them, and it looks really good, and everyone else is eating it, it would have been so easy to say for Daniel, well, it's just, it's just food. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? Or, you know, I'll eat the food, but I'll just think about the God of Israel while I eat the food. But Daniel and his friends saw right through it. They saw that the compromise would have taken place if they would have eaten it. And they also would have known that if another exile would have seen them eating the food, that that would give them a license to do the same. Maybe another exile didn't have the privilege of eating the king's food. But if they saw Daniel and his friends eating food that was sacrificed to idols, then it would encourage them to worship the idols as well. It's so subtle. It is so subtle. But there are so many things today even in the world that we live in that are clearly from different religions, different worldviews, different spiritual structures that we need to be aware of. And we need to make the decision, will we abstain or will we engage with it? The other way that the king's food brought compromise in addition to the idolatry is through the dulling of the spiritual senses. Daniel and his friends, along with the other exiles in the king's court, would have been extremely smart and ambitious and competent young men if they were to be in the king's training program. And the king's food would have had all of the, all the richest food you can imagine. I mean, think, the, the, the most powerful, rich empire in the world, importing foods from all over the globe, and it was set right before Daniel and his friends every single day, multiple times a day. Every day the students would eat, and the more they ate of this rich food, 
the more accustomed they would become to the food they were never used to in the land of Judah. And their senses would eventually be desensitized to this new lavish way of living, making it all the more difficult to take the difficult path of faith. Now, if you follow sports at all, I could see maybe a little parallel that maybe Daniel was thinking, maybe not thinking of, but what I think of with that. So if you follow football and you see a player who, who, who works really hard and they get this massive contract, multiple, multiple millions of dollars guaranteed money right in their bank account. Now, some players will continue to work and to play hard because they want their team to know that that money's justified in paying them and they want to do their best. But we see some players throughout history of the NFL that once they get that guaranteed money, they kind of just, they kind of sit back a little bit. They kind of enjoy the ride because they have guaranteed money. It's all in their bank account. And you know, the hard hits of football, the concussions, the broken bones, the bruises, it's not as enticing when you have that guaranteed money sitting in your bank account. And I think the same is true for us today as followers of Jesus, just like it was in the life of Daniel. The pleasures and the riches of this world, if not put in their right place, can desensitize us and make us complacent in our faith. For Daniel and his people, the food was given in an effort to seduce them into forsaking the difficult path of faith and giving into the easy way of pleasure. And we'll see later how Daniel and his friends interact with this situation. But the last item on this cultural reprogramming syllabus from Babylon is confusion. The nail in the coffin for the cultural reprogramming when taking the exiles in was to rename them. They've been isolated from others who were like them and their faith was isolated. They've been indoctrinated with all the things Babylon to teach them to think like Babylonians instead of Israelites. They were tempted to compromise by living a lavish lifestyle that they never knew before. Not only participating in pagan worship, but choosing the path of pleasure over the right way. And now they're given new names, leaving their old names in the past. And these new names were significant because in changing these names, the name of the God of Israel, which is found in each of these four people's names, is taken out. And with these new names is replaced the Babylonian gods and goddesses. So the more these exiles heard their new names, the more they would take on that identity and believe that that is who they are now. And the cultural reprogramming is now complete for some. Now, I'm guessing that most people today have never lived in a totalitarian, a totalitarian empire like Babylon, where you're forcibly taken from your home, brought to a new land to be incorporated with the conquered or conquering people groups. But even though we don't live in that time or that land today, I believe these four pillars of cultural reprogramming still exist today. In our world of technology today, that is unbelievably connected on the surface through social media. Think about how isolated so many people feel. In this age of social media where it feels like you know everybody and yet at the same time you know nobody. There are spiking levels among young people of depression, of anxiety through social media because of the isolation that's taking place. And today our faith can also be isolated. We live in a culture where the truth of God isn't accepted nor appreciated. The gospel of Jesus Christ in some circles is now labeled as a hate message rather than what it really is, which is the loving sacrifice of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ for all who believe in his name. In our world of universal tolerance today, the message of the gospel that Jesus is the only way to salvation comes with significant pushback. So our faith is isolated. 
Our faith is sought to be taken and kept within the four walls of the church instead of taken out into the world to be shared with others. Additionally, even in the churches today, in our culture of technology, there's a significant temptation for Christians to isolate in their homes following the pandemic with the ease of live streaming and other means. Now, I'm so grateful for the blessing of technology. Please hear me. I'm grateful for technology. I'm grateful for live streaming. And if you're unable to get out of the house due to family emergency, due to medical illness, due to being out of town for work, please utilize this blessing of live stream to hear God's word and to worship with us virtually. But if you are able to come to church, if you are able to be in community with us here at Trinity, I ask you to worship with us in person because our strength comes from when we can worship together corporately. Not only when you can hear other voices singing the praises of God, that encourages me, that encourages my heart, hearing you sing the praises of God. But another encouraging thing is having conversations with people before and after the service, being in the lobby, having sharpening conversations with other people about what God is doing in your life. Those are the things that you can't really get fully when you're at home. So my encouragement to you is, if you can, to worship with us together because there's no substitute for worshiping in person. Not only do we face the temptation to be isolated from our faith and from meeting together, but we're surrounded by the things of this world. We are inundated with messages of the world And what the world values and the warning that I want to give to us today is this. Be aware of what you consume. Be aware of what you consume. Sometimes it's so subtle. Sometimes it's everywhere around us. But be aware of what you consume. Be alert and be awake. Because just like Babylon, these messages from the world today, either intentionally or unintentionally, are trying to have us think like the world instead of thinking like a Christian with a biblical worldview. And the messages in these times can be so subtle. And so church needs to be awake. We need to be alert. We need to be awake as a church. Know the Bible and stand up for what it says. We can't escape from the things of this world, but we can be aware of what's going on in our world. We can be aware of the messages that are taking place in our world. And parents, part of it is is understanding what your kids are learning on social media, in other forms of entertainment, in school as well. It's understanding what is being communicated to your children. And I encourage you to do research, to understand what's going on in your kid's life. And I would recommend a resource from Focus on the Family And it's called Back to School for Parents. And and if you just Google Focus on the Family, Back to School to Parents, you'll find it. And there will be some information that's helpful for you, some that you may not use, but it's important for us to be aware and to be alert and awake to what is happening around us in this world. And another thing we need to be alert and awake to as followers of Jesus is the area of compromise. Are you engaging in things that may compromise your Christian witness or may tempt you to walk away from your faith? Do you start with the defense of something you're doing with, well, it's only this, or it's, it's not as bad as that? Are you allowing the possessions of this world to dull your spiritual senses and cause you to to pull up and walk instead of continuing to run the race with vigor. Because we live in confusing times, don't we? We live in some real confusing times. There are so many pressures, so many temptations around us. Things that are contrary to the word of God. And in the midst of this, and, and in the midst of all of that, In the midst of all the confusion about who we are, we have to remember our identity as followers of Jesus. That we are made in the image of God. That we are children of God. And we must remember the truth in God's word to guide us. 
Now, at this point, you may be feeling a little, little down. <laughs> Maybe you feel a little over, overwhelmed. Wow, these four pillars, cultural reprogramming. It's kind of a downer. But I want to encourage you that Daniel and his friends give us a proven framework of how to live a godly life in the midst of a culture of compromise. So how did Daniel do that? How did his friends live boldly in this world of compromise? Well, the first thing that they did, and the first encouragement to us, is to resolve not to compromise before you're faced with the temptation. Resolve not to compromise before you're faced with the temptation. We read in verses 1 through 7 about the subtle conquering that takes place in the heart and mind in Babylon through the four pillars of isolation, indoctrination, compromise, and confusion. But notice verse 8. After all this takes place, it says, But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Babylon had laid out its syllabus, but Daniel already knew the answer. And it came from his relationship with the Lord. We're told not to, we are told that Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself. Now, the definition of resolve, the definition of having resolution is to decide firmly on a course of action. Now, let me ask you a question. Have you ever made a decision in your life? Have you ever made a decision on a course of action in your life with complete confidence without ever thinking about it prior to that decision? When you met your soon-to-be spouse, first time you met him, you say, yep, let's do it. Let's get married. Or college or a job. Did you ever make a decision in your life where you didn't put prior thought into what was taking place? Resolution requires prior thought on, or preparation to determine a course of action, and Daniel had done so. He grew up in a home in Judah that would have taught the ways and the scriptures of God. On his way to Babylon, you think Daniel had time to think about what was going to happen and how he, res- how he would respond? When he heard about what was going to happen in Babylon, do you think Daniel took time to think about how he would respond? You bet he did. To think about his course of action. And that's so important for us as followers of Jesus today in the currents of culture. When I was in high school, I I worked at a boys' summer camp. And one of the things that the counselors would do at the end of our two-week training is that we'd go whitewater canoeing. And if anyone's ever been whitewater canoeing, you know it's an adventure, I mean, take a kayak, make it more unstable with no rudder, and that's whitewater canoeing. Um, it seems crazy, and it kind of is, but it's really fun. And, and so what we would do is we would canoe the Brule River. And so we'd start near Brule, Wisconsin, and we'd canoe a few days until we got to Lake Superior. Now, on the Brule River, there are some fairly significant rapids, some drops that take place from rocks, and, and, and some pretty good currents that take place in the river. And if you know anything about whitewater canoeing, then you know the two words that you're thinking or should be thinking when you go through rapids. And those two words are paddle hard. (laughs) Paddle hard. You have to paddle hard because the temptation is when you see the rapids coming, what's the temptation? Put the paddle down and just hold on. I don't want to fall off. So you hold on. But the irony is, is the less you paddle, the more you are likely to fall over. The less you paddle, the more the currents will take you wherever the currents want you to go. And people are yelling at you when you're going through the rapids to paddle hard because the harder you paddle, the more you can propel yourself through the currents. The more you shoot the gaps and get through the rocks, the more that you can speed your way through the current and be better off for it. And the same is true today for us as followers of Jesus. If we aren't resolute in our walk with the Lord, we'll be taken away by the currents of the world. If we aren't running the race of faith with vigor, we're going to be swept wherever the current wants us to go. Because here's the truth. If you're not moving forward in your faith, you're moving backwards. It's that simple. 
If you're not moving forward in your faith, you're moving backwards. If you let, if you let the currents of the culture come to you, then you'll be swept away wherever they want to take you. And as followers of Jesus, like Daniel, we must know what we believe, why we believe it, and what that means for how we live. We have to make the decision now in our hearts. So when the time comes, we can take it. The second principle for living boldly in a foreign land is live in the world, but don't let the world live in you. Look back at verses 17 through 21 of Daniel chapter 1. You'll notice something really interesting if you scan those verses. You'll notice that not only did Daniel and his friends engage with the things of this world, with the wisdom, with the literature of the world, but they actually excelled in their understanding. They actually excelled. They aced all their exams in in all things Babylon. Verse 20 says that they were 10 times better in the king's opinion than anybody else in wisdom and understanding. And, and that would be the language, and that would be the literature of the Babylonians they were learning, which is an important reminder for us today that we are in this world just like Daniel was in Babylon. For Christians today, this world is not our home. Our, our real home is in heaven, right? Our citizenship is in heaven. And so this world is not our permanent home, but we are in it, Nonetheless, and notice that, that Daniel didn't object to the learning of the Babylonian occult, culture because, again, Daniel and his friends learned the ways of Babylon and excelled at them, but the important part is that they didn't let the things of Babylon become a part of them. They would have learned astrology for understanding but not for belief. They would have studied the Babylonian gods and goddesses for understanding but not for belief. They would have studied all these different things in in the Babylonian culture to understand them, to be effective, but not for belief. Just like today, we as Christians can learn the things of this world and excel at the things of this world and yet not allow them to live in us. Excel at business, but don't allow money and power to consume you. Study science And thrive in that field. But remember who the creator is. Practice music and be the best musician you can be. But give glory to God. What would happen in our world if we had Christians who were the experts in their field. And yet gave glory to God. What would happen? If in every different business category. Political category. Scientific category. We had followers of Jesus excelling at what they did and yet understanding where their gifts come from. The impact would be tremendous. So the message for us today from Daniel and his friends is this, live in the world, but don't let the world live in you. Just like Daniel and his friends didn't allow the Babylonian ways that were against scripture to live in them, we could do the same today. And the last principle for living boldly in a foreign land is don't give up the high ground. This is huge. It might be one of the most important lessons we can learn from this Daniel chapter one today in 2022. As we'll see throughout this book, Daniel had an uncanny ability to have ironclad convictions and yet be a person of gentleness and respect. Ironclad convictions and yet be a person of grace and peace. And we know that because Daniel was one of the most respected people of every person in the Babylonian kingdom. We don't read of anybody having real founded problems with Daniel or his personality or the way he went about things. Despite him being a devout follower of the God of Israel. And we see that first instance take place in verse 8. Look at verse 8 again, the first part. But Daniel resolved he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. There's the resolve. There's the ironclad convictions. I am not doing this based on my beliefs. But look at the second part of verse 8. Therefore, he asked, asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him to not defile himself. Don't miss this today. 
Daniel had deeply rooted convictions and beliefs, but he didn't give up the high ground in carrying out those convictions. Daniel respectfully asked to go against the king's command and gave a reasonable path moving forward. If you read the rest of chapter one, the chief of the eunuchs is like, hey man, um, I'd love to do that, to have you not eat that, but that means I'm gonna get fired, and by fired, I mean executed. So I can't do that. But Daniel gave him a reasonable path forward, saying, hey, listen, test us for 10 days and see how we do. And turns out they did great. And so Daniel offered a reasonable path moving forward because he understood the chief of the eunuchs had a responsibility as well. And so he wanted to be respectful of what he was doing as well. He didn't give up the high ground. Now the phrase taking the high ground means taking the loving and right approach to the situation to maintain and preserve a relationship despite having a disagreement or tension. Daniel knew he couldn't eat the food. He knew it went against his convictions. And he was respectful in how he communicated to the chief of the eunuchs about his disagreement with what was happening. Now, I'm sure many of you know where I'm going with this. Because unfortunately, many Christians over the past few years have given up the high ground. Unfortunately, over the past few years, wearing or not wearing a mask, vax or no vax, your political preferences, constitutional opinions, and the desire to be right have superseded having a gospel witness and a relationship with others. I'm not saying to abandon your, convic your convictions. I'm not saying to change your opinions. I'm not trying to change your opinions. Notice, Daniel had unbelievably deep convictions. And so what I'm telling you is, hold on to those. Because God's word is truth. Amen? Hold on to those convictions. So I'm not telling you, change what you believe. But how about this? What if Christians were the most devout in their convictions and yet the most loving and respectful people? What if Christians never swerved from believing what is contained in the word of God and yet were the most gracious and respectful and approachable people? Can you imagine what would happen What if we held to the objective and the exclusive message of Christianity and yet loved people who didn't agree with that in hopes of them eventually coming to know Jesus? Remember the words of the Apostle Peter in 1 Peter 3.15 when he says, But in your hearts honor Christ the Lord as holy, always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. And yet do it with gentleness and respect. See the last part of the verse? Gentleness and respect. <laughs> do it with gentleness and respect. We must always be ready to give a reason for our faith. Peter states that. We have to be ready to give the reason for why we believe what we, what we believe. Nowhere is Daniel saying, nowhere is Peter saying, abandon your convictions to agree with people. Because, right, sometimes it's not going to be peaceful when you say, sorry, I can't do that. There's going to be tension involved with that. But Peter says to do so with gentleness and respect. And unfortunately, many, many Christians over the past few years have compromised their Christian witness, not because of the message they're saying, but because of the method they use. It's not because of what they're saying. What they're saying is 100% right. It's the way they say it. That can really damage the witness. In following the example of Jesus, we are to speak the truth in love in hopes that people would come to know Jesus as their personal Savior. Don't abandon the convictions but ask God to give you empathy. Ask God to see what other people are going through and how you can engage with them in a gentle and a grace-filled way. 
Because I believe if we do that, if we are the most devout people in the world with our convictions in the word of God, and yet we are approachable, respectful, and grace-filled, I believe we could do amazing things by the power of God. I believe we can, I believe God can work through his people in amazing ways. So Trinity Church, in, in light of Daniel chapter one, in light of living boldly in a world of compromise, are you ready to live boldly in a world of intimidation? Are you ready to be resolute in your biblical convictions and stand up for the truth in the midst of the world you live in, regardless of what happens? And are you ready to love others even if they disagree, that they may be convinced through your words and your deeds of Jesus Christ living in you? My prayer is that you would join, join me in that. We'll do it imperfectly. But my prayer is like Daniel, that we would be resolved in God's word and yet grace-filled in our approach. Let's pray. God, I'm amazed at the, the example of Daniel. And Lord, I'm amazed reading Daniel chapter one because sometimes it feels like I'm looking into 2022, the culture we live in, what's going on in our world today. And yet I'm so encouraged about how Daniel and his friends show an unrelenting desire to follow you and they do so in a winsome way. And they do so with conviction. God, give us the courage. Give us the courage to hold deep to your word. And yet to be loving and respectful and approachable. Give us strength as we go through our weeks, through our days. To stand on the truth of the gospel no matter what happens. We pray in Jesus' name, amen.